People always tell me that the Pokemon games have lost their soul. They say Pokemon has run out of ideas because they are basing new Pokemon on jobs and inanimate objects as if they hadn't always. They always did that, did that. Old thing good, new thing bad, bad. They say Pokemon is now just shoveling out games before doing any amount of QA testing just to get products on shelves. And I say, absolutely that part is true. True. But there's always been a part of me that thinks, no, no, it's not that the games have lost their soul. It's just that you've grown up. Now you see the repeating patterns that were always there. You see the tried ideas that they and others have done already. You compare them to more past experiences you've had. You understand the deeper game mechanics, so the games and such seem easier and less thought out, when really, it's you. Who's changed, changed, changed. And yet, every now and again, I'm brought back into this melancholic existence we call reality, and my eyes are forced open. And looking deeply into the designs and origins around the Pokemon Gym badges has been one of these moments. Hello. Over the last many whiles, we've looked into every gym badge in the mainline games. What are they based on? What do they look like? Why do they look that way? Etc. And there's been a bit of a trend. While there always were the simple, thoughtless badges like the Boulder Badge, there's also always been badges with deeper designs and thoughts put into their names. Like the Soul, Marsh, Thunder, and Earth Badges, all from Gen 1, are incredibly deep and thought out for being in a Game Boy game. The Plane Badge is like a quadruple pun. The Zephyr Badge? Like what is a Zephyr? And the Steel-type Mineral Badge in Olivine City? Olivine being the mineral we mostly use to make molds for pouring liquid metal into, there's so much depth. And then we lose some. The heat badge, knuckle badge, feather, rain, meh. There's some thought when it comes to the cities they're in and what their leaders look and be like, but Hmm. We do see some death return in Gen 4. Now more than ever, certain parts of the badges directly resemble some part of the gym leader's design and the location of their city. Very cool. They just look kinda lame. And then Gen 5, we really start to lose it again. The cities and leaders surrounding the badges are still exemplary, but the badges themselves are... well, the basic badge. Insect. Bolt, Quake, Freeze, Toxic, you might as well just start naming all of the badges directly after the type and call it a day. This is foreshadowing. Because while yes, the first badge you get in Gen 6 is the Bug Type Bug Badge, the rest of the badges here are nice and interesting. But after this generation, all is lost. Gen 7 removed gyms and badges altogether, which was a very welcome change at the time. Anything for a single seed of spice of something different in my Pokémon is welcome, but looking back now, we realize it's probably because they had given up on the badge names and designs entirely. Because when we look ahead to Gen 8, what do we get? The Grass Badge, the Water Badge, Fire Badge, Fighting Badge, the Ghost Badge, Fairy Badge, Rock Badge. The Ice Badge, Dark Badge, and the Dragon Badge, oh, and me now. It's just, uh, it's just the name of the type with the type symbol on it. Like at least they had different gym leaders with different types for different versions of the game, and at least all the badges had these shapes that can then all be put together to make one ultimate disc of badge. Like that's cool, it's the same way that British coins come together to make the coat of arms. Perfectly fitting of Galar. But then they truly just gave up on Paldea. The badges are now truly in arguably 100% devoid of our precious soul. <laughs> Every badge looks exactly the same, but with its corresponding type symbol on it. That's it. And they are all just named after the type they are too. Zero uniqueness, zero personality, zero soul. Soul, 
So. So let's let's move back to where we really are in this badge series. We're in Kalos, Gen 6. The last Pokemon badges to have any. So. 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 Okay, that's enough with the echo effect, please. Oh, besides the first badge, the first one does not have any. The first badge in the Kalos League is given to you in the flowery Santa Luna city by Viola. And it looks like this. The Bug Badge. Name aside, it's a pretty cute badge. And I love that the spots on the wings are this shade of green. It's the shade that the bug type typically is. Also, the way the antenna go outwards and then join together looks a lot like Viola's hair, but like upside down. Especially when you look at the swooping insect antenna-like shape of the two side strands. And there's a kind of beetle we should mention. The Mormolycephilides nuts. Minus the nuts. Um, that is also known as the Violin Beetle because it looks like a violin, and a violin is a slightly bigger version of the viola. And the badge is clearly inspired by beetles specifically, and violas are also flowers. Flowers that are notoriously loved by aphids. And what famously eats aphids? Beetles, especially ladybugs, which the badge is the spitting image of. It really all comes together with just a terrible, terrible name that's terrible. But also given that her ace Pokemon is Vavillian, you could also see it as a stylized Vavillian head too, or an ant head. So it's kind of perfectly generic bug then, right? Fitting then that the gym is in Santa Luna City, which comes from the French word for sandalwood, a fragrant wood that specifically moths and butterflies absolutely adore. Now then, the next badge is the badge of shame I'm giving Nintendo. We'll call it the Missed Opportunity Badge. I remember when the Switch was first revealed and we got a look at the Joy-Cons and I immediately thought, OMG, because of the way they work, they will totally release Joy-Cons with different button layouts based on their other controllers. And I went online and yeah, lots of people had the same idea. It's a great idea after all. One with the GameCube's layout would be a dream come true to me. It's been almost a decade, Nintendo. Where is it? And that's where today's sponsor, Nixie, comes in. Oh, hello. Yes, yes, they approached me and I saw the Nixie wizard and I'm like, yes! <laughs> yes, 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 yes! And here they are, beautiful. A high quality blend of that retro setup and modern sensibilities. The classic Millennium Platinum. The triggers are extremely tactile and responsive. There's programmable buttons on the back. There's turbo buttons. And the second analog stick actually feels like a stick instead of a nipple. And both sticks are no drifting Hall effect sticks. But my favorite feature has to be these swappable stick gates. You've got your angled one to make the stick feel just like the GameCubes, but it also comes with circular ones for smoother motion like on modern controllers. And of course they function fully as Joy-Cons with the side buttons and the ability to attach to the Switch directly. Hot dog, is it beefy now though? So they also offer carrying cases to accommodate it. And they've got lots more on offer too. Other controllers for various consoles in various styles. But this is definitely my favorite. So check them out with the link in the video description. Get you or a friend a great Christmas gift. And thanks again to Nixie for supporting us. Now then, we make our way to the Cliffside Silage City, and after we beat Grant, we are rewarded with the Cliff Badge, which is obviously the Rock-type badge. It's pretty neat though, when you think about it for at least a second. The arrangement of these three rectangles are like three tiers, like they are raising you upwards towards the top of a rocky mountain. They also kind of look like the hand and footholds on rock climbing walls, which is what Grant's gym looks like. But they also look like the different layers of the Earth's strata, aka the layers of Earth you always see in like earth crust diagrams and the colors of the badge combined with the tiered look of it is very reminiscent of Grant's own hair. It's very sporty, like the city it's in. On top of rock climbing, this city's got beach trails and mountain bike courses. I mean, with a name like Silage, a cycling village on a ledge, that makes sense. Or rather, sense. Because, oh good, just like how Unovan cities were all cloud puns, Kalos towns are all aromatics. Sillage is a French word for a scented trail, like from a wake. So if you were burning incense or sage and walking along a trail, you that would be sillage. So it's a good physical activity themed way of keeping with the smell theme. Now get ready to rumble badge, because we're going to show our city to get the rumble badge, which you receive after defeating Corina and her Lucari dose. 
for her two Lucarios. It's pretty clearly just two gloved hands meeting in the middle, which is why it's no surprise that it's the fighting type badge. Looks good, I guess, but it's pretty boring, inspirationally. It's just like fighting type orange. Like they could have tweaked the colors to make it match Karina's outfit or something. But anyway, it's also like the two fists together pose that some fighters do while meditating as a part of training. Like under a waterfall, you know, that whole trope. And that's kind of Lucario's whole deal. Fighting, meditation, and sensing aura. Which brings us to the city name. It references the Chalor Bay in France, yes. But also, with its spelling specifically, it references the Shala tree, whose resonant incense are sacred to practitioners of Buddhism and Hinduism, specifically for meditation. Now to Coal Marine City. Oh boy, is it marine. It's by a bay, so water type surely. Nope, it's grass, that's even cooler. The badge itself is a big leaf with a bluish hue to it, almost aquamarine green in color. And I like how the fenestrations in the leaf are shaped almost like a small sprouting plant itself. Fenestrations are the holes and slits naturally found in some leaves. In this case, it's most likely the famous Monstera deliciosa. They are incredibly popular plants for gardeners and house plant hobbyists and enthusiasts alike due to their unique looks and relative ease of care. This is ours, if you couldn't tell by me batting it a bunch. Look at this leaf. It's so pretty. Look, this is double fenestrated, if you can tell. I like this plant. The gym leader here is Ramos, an old man who loves gardening, a common hobby for retired seniors. His beard is weird, but maybe it's to look like the bottom part of the badge? Hmm. Well, he chose a good town to live in. Comarine's mild yet sunny climate is perfect for Monsteras. And again, the city name works great. It's marine, yes, but it's also Kumaru, the French word for tonka beans, which grow natively in and around French Guiana. And of course, they are extremely fragrant and are as commonly used in cooking as they are in perfume making in France. Now we head to the middle of it all, the very luminous Illumino City, where we battle and defeat Clement the Inventor and get the Voltage Badge. While it's clearly the electric type badge, it is kinda weird for an electric badge. Like, it's got the cliche lightning bolts, kinda, and it's yellow, but also, like, what's with its weird shield-y shape? Like, it doesn't super seem to fit. Like, is this supposed to be a part of Clement's solar charger, which absorbs sunlight to charge and later acts as a flashlight? Like, weird to make it shaped like just one of the flaps, but that would explain these weird lightning bars coming out from the middle like that. It's less lightning and more bright lens flare, stylized pointing of light directly at the camera kind of thing. Did that make sense? Um, is it a shield because it's like a coat of arms? I mean, Lumino City is based on Paris, the French city. But the Paris coat of arms doesn't really fit. Uh, perhaps the diplomatic emblem of France? Yeah, if you replace the leaves with bolts or light lines, I guess maybe. What an ugly badge. For shame, Clement. Shame. What you have in brains, you lack in an artist's touch and common sense. The city itself is pretty thematically fitting though. Paris' own nickname is the City of Light, or in French, La Ville Lumière, hence Luminos. Is it mixing rose in there? Luminose? Roses are very aromatic and are one of the most common scents in like perfumes and stuff. Well, in the game's original Japanese, the city is named Mier City, which also comes from La Ville Lumière, while also referring to Mier Incense. So yes, smells are still absolutely at play. <laughs> now let's head into the magical fairy tale forest and find the magical La Ver City with its 13 hour clock that we explained in great detail in this video. Check it out if you like fairies, it's cool. This is where we will fight Valerie for the aptly named Fairy Badge. Now normally, I'd say this is dumb, stupid, lame even, to have a badge named just after its type. But Fairy was brand new at the time. This game invented it, and it was a big main marketing thing, so, you know, Fairy was a big deal, so, Fine. It's acceptable. Not good, but acceptable. I do like the design though. It's like fancy stained glass and resembles fairy wings, perhaps even Valerie's own arms when put together. Now, there's quite a bit of lore around her that we won't get into here because I don't like the way she's looking at me. Uh, but as far as the badge goes, the stained glass look is perfect. While stained glass was first made by either the Egyptians or Romans, depending on who you ask, it got huge in Europe in the Middle Ages, especially 
France. And out of all of the European countries, France was the one who kept up with the art form through the ages. Elsewhere in Europe and abroad, the use of stained glass came and went, in and out of style and in and out of fashion. But France always had the greater continuity of stained glass production. And it just looks so whimsical and magical too, especially for the time, so it being used in the fairy type badge is just too perfect. But does the city fit? You betcha. Laver City comes from lavender, another very fragrant plant used in soaps and perfumes, but also it could pull from river or river. It's French for dreaming, as in in game, Laver City is referred to as the city of otherworldly dreams. Almost like this is in a fairy realm during a witching hour with that 13-hour clock. And now to the penultimate gym in Anastar City. Upon victory against Olympia, we obtain the Psychic Badge. <sighs> okay, I take back what I said about the Fairy Badge being acceptable. We now have three badges in this generation, just named after their type. Clearly, we were already on the path towards every badge just being named after the type like we got in Gen 8 and 9. But it just hurts so much more because not all of them are that in this gen. It's just, you can see it. Looking back in hindsight, you can see their lost inspiration. Oof. But hey, it still looks cool. So there's that. Not only does it look like a future seeing crystal ball with smoky dreamlike smoke coming from it, but it also kind of resembles Olympia's own hair and outfit, or kind of like a Jin or genies materializing out of the purple ball on the bottom. Both are also very nebula-esque and spacey, which makes it being located in Anis Star City so fitting. It is named after Star Anis, or Anis. Anis? Anus? It's a plant with a star-shaped fruit pod, and they're common in spices the world over, most notably in things like masala chai, Vietnamese pho, and one of the ingredients in traditional Chinese five spice, because it's just very aromatic, and it's often also burnt as incense, and that's already all extremely fitting. But also consider this. Olympia is Greek, possibly. There's no, like, Greeks in... Pokemon world, but, you know, she's Greek. I mean, she's in France, which is very close by, but then she's also got the tanned skin, and her name is Olympia, and that makes sense because, like, Mount Olympus, the Celestial Olympians, the Olympics, one of the starters of this generation, Fennekin, eventually becomes the psychic fire-type Del Fox, who's named after both foxes and Delphic oracles, ancient Greek future-seeing psychics who burned a lot of incense and herbs to receive their visions from the gods. They were extremely high. But the way you see incense smoke just woo 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 wooing up is just like the smoke coming off of the crystal ball in the badge. So there you go. And now we finally go to Snowbell City for the final badge in Kelos. And before I even explain the gym or the badge, yes, it's Snowbell. It's ice type. And yes, even a snowbell is literally a thing. It's the common name for the Styrax genus of plants, which, yes, since the times of the ancient Greeks were used heavily for their strong smells to make incense and perfumes. But yes, here's Wolfric. He gives you the iceberg badge. It looks like an iceberg floating on water within a hexagon with water droplets at each point, which makes the hexagon look kind of like a snowflake. This badge's whole design just screams ice type so loudly that it could cause an avalanche in this city of ever lasting winter. Ah! It also kind of looks like Wolfric, maybe, I guess, possibly. Not just because of his blue coat that he, of course, only wears on his shoulders like the cool guy he is, but also because of his spiky collar and his overall hexagonal head shape. And it's also kind of like the necklace he always wears, which is a locket that is an elongated hexagon. Fun fact, the locket is said to have his dearest Pokemon photo in it, though the only time we really get a clear look at what's inside of his locket is in the concept art of him where you can see it's a picture of his wife and two children, along with a very tippy top of a little Pokemon head, which is very clearly a Bergmite, which is assumedly his ace Pokemon, Avalug, when it was little. Cute little detail. But speaking of Avalug, the colors and shape of the iceberg in the center of the badge are very reminiscent of Avalug. And the fact that it's a hexagonal snowflake is like his second strongest Pokemon, Cryogonal. 
So it turns out, like an iceberg, there's a lot more hidden under the surface of this man. Like, did you know that he's named after the Wolfiana Carthanaka, which are varying shades of blue and blue purple, and the flowers are tubular and have about six points, like the badge, and are teardrop shaped in profile, like the water droplets at the end of the snowflake tips? They originated in the Alps, which do go into France and are very cold and snowy. And these flowers often do droop down like Wolfric's mutton chop ends. It's pretty cool, right? Like, I see what they did there, but now I'm not gonna snowflake on you and end the video here because Lord knows I'm not going to explain the Alola Islands challenge stamps in their own video. So let's just see how far Pokemon fell after this. Alola doesn't do the whole gym thing. They're too chillaxed or something. Well, until Kakui decides to start the gym league in the region, but that won't be relevant till towards the end of the game. Instead of a Pokemon league, you advance through the game by competing in the island challenge, which involves doing various challenges on each island, which will then let you challenge the island's kahuna. And there are no badges for completing each trial. There's only stamps, and the stamps, while pretty, aren't all that complicated complicated to explain. They're just like a stamp of the island's guardian Tapu's face from the front, and then you get another stamp for defeating the region's Elite Four and Professor Kakui and thus becoming Alola's first champion. But the stamp is just a stylized rendering of the island's challenge's amulet you receive from before the challenge even starts, which is a cute design that incorporates elements from all four Tapu's designs, but like, it's still pretty simple. With sword and shield, we at least have actual gyms again, and thus have badges, though it's definitely a cop-out because each badge is just a simple icon of that gym type with any sliver of a broken coin. And when all of them are put together, it forms an entire coin. A cool idea, but it makes an otherwise interesting bit of lore and character, the badges themselves individually, kind of meaningless. And then we get to Paldea, where the Pokemon company has clearly just given up all attempts at putting forth, like, any effort towards the gym badges themselves. Because each badge is finally just the type symbol in the same circular border with the same metallic silver background. Though it is pretty interesting to note that with the introduction of the two main non-league storylines, it's the first region to have non-league badges. The Starfall Street badges all have the Team Star logo in negative, but as that base of color. But it still has the same background and border as the Gym's badges. It's almost like they themselves spray painted their logo onto the badge, which is kind of fun and fitting of the fact that Team Star is just a school gang composed of weirdly cool dorks. Another cool thing to note is that when you include the Starfall Street badges and the Path of Legends badges, there's a badge of sorts for all 18 Pokemon types, which I do think is pretty neat, but I don't think that really excuses the total lack of Sol in the actual gym badges themselves. But admittedly, I do love the fact that with the earning of each badge, you also take a selfie with all of the leaders, or on the Path of Legends, uh, you take five different selfies with Arvin. Arvin is definitely one of the most fleshed out Poke Girls the series has had yet, so I'll let that one slide once. And that's that then. We've now explained every gym badge. If you missed one of the previous videos, they are all linked somewhere, I'm sure. What's your favorite badge? And do you have any means of defending Game Freak for this travesty? If so, let me know down below. Thanks for watching, and until next time, never stop using your noggin like Game Freak did when it came to designing the badges in Gen 9.